It certainly is good to see you this Good Friday, and honestly, Good Friday is one of my favorite moments in the entire year as a church. It's a time where we get to come together as a family. Good Friday normally feels to me like one big, giant church family dinner, Uh, because we come together. It's in the evening. That's not normal for us. Uh, We come together right around dinner time. We gather around the Lord's table. Uh, There's not as many visitors on Good Friday as there normally are on Easter Sunday morning. So it's a time where we can get together and have a little family chat, right? And we think as a church, even just about some of the things that draw us together as a family. And I'd say one of the things, if you're a part of Compass Bible Church, that kind of bonds us together is we all share a concern about the state of our culture. Uh, Even in particular, uh, we we share a concern about the state of the church and the state of Christianity in our culture. Uh, To put it maybe in the most straightforward and blunt way possible, one thing many of us are concerned about is there's just a lot of fake Christians walking around our world, especially in our culture where it's so easy to name the name of Christ and cultural Christianity has such a great influence. It's so clear that there are many who would claim Christianity of some form, but are they following Jesus? No, they're not. And as Jesus warns in Matthew chapter 7, at one of the most intense and I think frightening passages in all the Bible where he warns about many Not just a few, many who on judgment day will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we do this in your name and and this? And and he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. And, And as we think through that and as we respond to the prevalence of that in our culture, we emphasize repentance. Not that we've made that up, that's what Jesus emphasized. If you have not repented, you are not saved. If you have not turned from your sin to experience the grace of Christ, then you are not a genuine Christian. We talk about things like fruit and in your, your faith, there being evidence of your faith. And we do that because the Bible does that. The Bible says that faith without works is dead. And so those are things that as a church family, we emphasize, we will continue to emphasize, we won't apologize for emphasizing, because there are things our culture really needs to hear. But there's one thing I really want us to remember as a family tonight, even as we think about those things. Repentance is essential, but it is a response to something Good works are essential, not as the means of something or anything, but as the evidence of something. Tonight, as we gather as a family around the Lord's table, I want to bring back to our minds and make sure, hey, this needs to be front and center of all of those concerns. What is the something that we are responding to? Or to put it another way, we've been focusing this whole week on paradise. That's been our theme. Last weekend, we looked at Genesis 3, and you know, how did we lose paradise back in the garden um, in the fall? Uh, this week, throughout the week, we looked at little different glimpses of paradise that we get even right here, right now. But tonight, the question we want to ask is, well, how do we get back to paradise? Or another way to put so much of what we have been talking about is, If someone were to ask you, why should you be let in to paradise? What would you say? And if the answer starts with something like, because I repented of my sins, because I look at all this good fruit in my life. If whatever your answer to that question is begins with I, we've got a problem. We've put the cart in front of the horse. We have buried the lead. If you think through why should you get into paradise, the answer needs to begin with because Jesus. Because of what he has done. And anything I've done is only a response to what he has done. And to drive that point home for us this evening, I want us to look at one figure Uh, especially a prominent one on the original Good Friday. Turn with me, take your Bibles, and let's look at Luke 
chapter 23. Luke 23, just a few verses here. Luke 23, verses 39 through 43. And it, to set the stage for what's going to happen in these verses, Jesus is on the cross. And, you know, we bring out our cross here once a year on Good Friday, and I think it does help to see it, you know, not as a wall decoration or not on somebody's piece of jewelry, but even to see it more to scale of what it would have been like to be reminded of what it is, a device of torture and death, is what the cross was. Imagine someone actually being nailed to a cross, hanging there, being left to die. And even we know Jesus was on the cross for six hours, and they were surprised when he was dead. That tells you normally it was much longer than that. You can imagine the physical suffering and agony of the cross. But often when you see an image of the cross, sometimes you'll see a picture not just of one cross, but of three crosses. Why three crosses? Well, Jesus was crucified, and the scripture tells us on either side of him, there were crucified two robbers, one on either side. That word could also be translated insurrectionists. These were violent criminals being crucified next to Jesus. And as Jesus is hanging on the cross, suffering the physical agony of that, the spiritual weight of all of that as well, he's also having to deal with the insults that are being hurled at him by all who pass by. And those two robbers on either side, guess what? They join on in with that. And they insult Jesus. They mock him until one of them starts to say something different. And that's what we want to look at in these verses today, starting in verse 39. It says, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And indeed, we justly for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he, Jesus, said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So we think, well, how, how do you get back to paradise. Why should you be let into paradise? Tonight, I want to remind all of us, the only hope we have is not because I anything. It's ultimately because of Jesus. But let's just make a couple observations here about this thief on the cross. And really, the first is what he admits about himself. And in verse 40, he gets theological. His, you know, Compadre, the other criminal there being crucified, he's being practical. Hey, aren't you the Christ? Get us out of this mess, right? He's looking for a temporal, physical salvation right here, right now. But the other thief on the cross, the one we remember, he gets theological and he rebukes him saying, do you not fear God? He starts to realize, hey, don't you realize there is a God who punishes sin? And don't you realize that we are here on the cross because we deserve it? We are getting what we deserve up here. And then he admits that this guy, he's not. This guy you're making fun of, he, he doesn't deserve to be up here. Shouldn't you fear God? Isn't that a cruel thing to do? You're getting what you deserve and you're making fun of somebody who's getting what they don't deserve. And in that moment, he admits his guilt. He admits his hopelessness, admitting I'm on a cross, I'm dying this horrible death, but I am getting what I deserve. That's a recognition that all of us need to make. If you're going to say anything about your hopes to get to paradise that begins with I. The only way you can end that is I deserve judgment. I don't deserve paradise. I deserve the opposite of paradise. 
Can you look at this right here tonight and say, that is what I deserve? Can you admit that? And that gets all of us thinking, well, man, how, how bad is my sin? And some of you might be thinking, yeah, yeah my sin's really, really bad. And maybe that's because of the rough life that you have lived or you know what it like, it's like to be a criminal in, in trouble with the law. And you know, yeah, I deserve some big kind of punishment. Maybe there's some of you that are thinking, you know, yeah, I mean, I'm not perfect. Who's perfect? I'm not perfect, but I don't know about that. Is my sin really that bad? Well, it's a good reminder. Guess what? You will not ultimately be the judge of how bad your sin is. God is the judge of how bad your sin is. And what is God's opinion about that subject? How serious does he think your sin and rebellion are? Again, he's already given us the answer. The cross says it all. That's exactly how serious God thinks our transgressions are. And that is why Jesus had to endure the cross for our sake. Listen to these familiar words from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 4 through 6. Surely he, clearly referring forward to the Messiah, has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. All very apt words to describe someone who had been brutally beaten and crucified. Why did that happen? Well, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We have to admit the reason Jesus was on the cross was because of my sin. I am just as guilty in putting Jesus upon that cross as anybody else. I am equally guilty. And even we think back to what we talked about last weekend, Genesis 3. How do we get into this mess? We looked at the lies of the devil and how he lured Eve into sin with these false promises. And really how the tragedy of what happened there is they had everything that they needed in the garden. But they gave all of that up seeking just something a little bit more. And doesn't that sound like things that you and I and every single one of us have all been guilty of in our own life? We are like sheep. We have strayed. In God, we would have everything we could ever possibly need. But every single one of us has gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. We're all guilty for why we are in the mess that we are in. But then there's the hope. I mean, another thing that's famously said in the prophet Isaiah, though our sins were scarlet, they will be what? White as snow. And even, hey, we, we got a little springtime reminder of that this week, right? White as snow. Or as we saying, they were, sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And again, if you're still thinking, well, you know, scarlet, crimson, those, those are pretty red. Mine's more like a, a pastel red, kind of a light red, right? It's not, no, they were like crimson. The first thing we need to see that observation is what this thief on the cross admits about himself. And you need to admit the same thing. If I were on the cross before a holy God, the only thing I'd be able to say is I'm getting what I deserve for my sin. And we say this, I mean, we're not meant to go digging up guilt and shame for past sins, and we'll see, well, how do we deal with that in a moment? But I do think it is helpful from time to time to really remember the weight of your sin, to stop and reflect on the things you have done that you know dishonor a holy God. And for you to admit just the weight of those sins, how truly evil they are. 
so that you can understand more of what Christ has done for us. Tonight, let the cross be a reminder not only of what Jesus has done, but also of what you and I deserve. Because he took it in our place. Why should you get into paradise? None of us can begin the answer to that question with, because I. Because if you're going to start to say, because I, the only ways you complete it, can complete that sentence are, I don't deserve paradise. I deserve the cross. So then we move from noticing what this man admits about himself to what he admits about Jesus. Where, where is the hope to be found? Because what the thief realizes on the cross is going to be the same hope for me and you as well. After he rebukes the other thief, he turns to Jesus and simply says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus immediately responds with a promise, basically a request, granted, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And that's one of the reasons why this passage is so beloved you know, all throughout the history of the church. It's so simple. It's so, yet so beautiful and, and precious at the same time. That's why, you know, people will talk about this. I recently came across, again, one viral sermon clip. Now, when a sermon clip goes viral on the internet, that usually means it's really good or it's really bad, right? Uh, thankfully, this was, this was one of the good, good ones of those, where, where the preacher kind of creates this imaginary scene of the thief at the cross kind of then at the gates of heaven, which there's nothing in the Bible that makes us think that's exactly how it works. But, you know, it's this imaginary scene. Why should you be let in? And the angels grill him on, well, tell us more about justification by faith. I've never heard of that before. Tell us more of what the doctrine of Scripture is all about. And he says, hey, all I know is the man on the middle cross said I could come. Right? And, and that's the beauty and the simplicity of this story. But even in what he admits about Jesus, I, I think... His faith is simple. He can't go on and then elaborate on all these doctrines of the faith. But there are some things that he knows in here. I mean, look again at what he says to Jesus. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That tells you something that he knew about Jesus. He knew that Jesus was the king. He knew that the words that were above Jesus' head there on the cross, the king of the Jews, he knew that those were not a lie. He knew that that was actually a true statement. And that's what drives him to say, hey, this guy's the king. Hey, and, and that means you're going to reign. You're, you're actually going to rule over a kingdom. Save a spot for me, Jesus. He knows that Jesus is the king. And even he admits that, there is truth to what this guy has been saying. I know you're the king. I know what you have said is true, and I know that you are my only hope. That's the same for you and me, that there is a king, and he's our only hope. And he also admits, even in, as he rebukes the other guy, he admits the innocence of Jesus. He knows that the only hope for him is an innocent yet crucified king. And that is the only hope for you and me as well. And we also have promises in Scripture. In response to that, right, think of Romans 10, 13, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Why should you get into paradise? Well, I don't deserve it. I deserve judgment. But the man on the middle cross, or even better, the king has said I could come. The king has welcomed me in. And my hope is not ultimately based on anything in me. It's 100% based on what Jesus did. I don't believe that, you know, well, the wall into paradise was too tall for me. So Jesus gave me a little boost and then I scrapped over, right? No. I couldn't do anything, but he opened the door for me and invited me in. 
And that's why I'm here. And even we think about not only how are we saved, it's through Christ and Christ alone. How then will we have assurance of that faith? Are there a lot of fake Christians out there? Yes. There are, are there also a lot of Christians out there that are saved, but one of your biggest struggles is knowing that you're saved, having a confidence that you're saved? How, how can you have that kind of confidence? How can you have that assurance? Do works play any role in our assurance? Biblically, yes, go read the book of 1 John. If you're not sure if you're a Christian, go read the book of 1 John. Blessed place, you can go. And you'll come across statements like, if anyone claims to have fellowship with God, yet walks in darkness, he is a liar, and the truth is not in him, right? But even that role of works, I would say, is it's kind of a supporting role. It is encouraging when you see that evidence. Again, not perfection, but you see that change of direction in your life. But is that the first thing we should look to? Man, am I, am I really saved or not? Is, the, is that the first place you should look? I would argue, no. First and foremost, we should say, my assurance, my hope in the sureness of my salvation is based on what Jesus has done for me. I am assured I'm going to heaven because of what Jesus said, because of what the Bible says, that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. We're gonna sing a song in a little bit, that the second verse begins with the words, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. And then as it goes on, it doesn't say, I, I tell Satan he's wrong. I tell him, no way, I'm way better than you're giving me credit for. No, that's not what it says, partly because that's not very poetic. Uh, <laughs> it says, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look. And see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free, for God, the just, is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Are you struggling with assurance? Don't obsess about, well, is there enough fruit in my life? First and foremost, look to the cross. Consider what Jesus has done for you. Let that be the anchor of your assurance. Even just consider these words from the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, verses 12, or 13 and 14 say, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. It's with him. It's because of him. And he, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. You will never be good enough there only was one person that ever was, and he is our hope, that he lived the righteous life, and he took our sin. Our sin is nailed to the cross. Why should you get into paradise? You don't deserve it, but you point to the cross and you say, I'm with him. My sin is nailed on the cross with him. I am raised to new life with him him, and I will live forever in paradise with him. I'm with him. That's what we say. Think of this on just so much of a lesser level, obviously, of an experience I had growing up, and that would be when I would go and visit my grandfather. My grandfather, he'd had a career as a doctor in the Navy, and then was a doctor uh, for a while there, but then he retired. I mean, that's the only stage of life I ever remember grandpa was being retired. And once he retired, he pretty much played golf full time. That was, that's what he did for a, a new job, right? He, he was living the country club life. And growing up as a pastor's kid in Texas, I mean, we had everything we needed, but we definitely were not living the country club life. But when we would go and visit grandpa, well, we were invited into that world. 
And, and also, growing up in Texas, we would go visit my grandpa, this place that he, he lived and was a part of. It was this small, sleepy, coastal town in, in Southern California where you'd look out and you'd see the ocean. And we, when we would go visit in the summertime, the high temperatures there were about the same as the low temperatures were in San Antonio, Texas. So you, it kind of felt a little bit like paradise from where we were coming from in Texas. And you'd be there, and you'd go with Grandpa to the country club, and if I'm being honest, I never looked like I belonged there. And sometimes you'd kind of catch like some of those sideways glances. Who is this kid, you know, loafing through the clubhouse with these old tennis shoes and an oversized, untucked polo shirt that he clearly inherited from one of his brothers because he needed something with a collar that wasn't church clothes, right? What's this kid doing here? And if ever I felt I was in any kind of awkward position with that, all I had to say was, oh, I'm Ernest Blakey's grandson. And then, you know, the complexion on their face would change. Oh, you're with Dr. Blakey. You know, that's what, that's what he was known by, you know, Dr. Blakey, right? And even there was one time I was looking at this one trophy in the country club. Oh, did my grandpa ever win this? I was looking for his name. And then I look at the center of the trophy, and he's like, the Ernest Blakey Cup, right? That's, that's who I was <laughs> dealing with here, right? Oh, you're with Dr. Blakey. Is there anything that you need? Is there anything that we can do for you? Because walking around that place, I didn't belong. I didn't deserve to be there. I wasn't paying the dues, right? I couldn't afford the entrance. I wasn't even paying the bill, right? Whenever I was there, never once did I have to pull out my wallet. All I had to do was say, I'm with him, right? I'm with my grandpa, right? When it comes to paradise, why should you get in to a place that we'll, we'll talk about on Sunday will be so much better than any place you've ever experienced on earth? We have to admit, I don't deserve to get in. I don't belong in there, but I'm with him. I have died with him. My sin has been nailed to the cross with him. I have been raised with him. And now I will be with him in paradise. That is our answer to that question. Not because I fill in the blank with anything, but because of him and because we are with him through faith.